Our first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with his wife, Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was experiencing, I'm sorry, expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And from Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10. Yes. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Judy. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Amen. All right, so this morning, um, when I wasn't sure if I was going to be speaking this morning or not, um, Eric had two dates that he had given us for his vacations, and I could not do the second one. And then about a month ago, he said, well, you're speaking on the 24th. I'm like, oh, Operation Christmas Child, okay. So, of course, speaking about Christmas is always kind of easy, but I wanted to connect it with his resurrection as well. So I want you to think about when you were a child, what was your most favorite holiday, not including your birthday? I just want you to think about that for a minute because for the most part, I think most of us can remember our most favorite Christmas in the world. Um, Christmas is usually a time of joy and celebration. There are some times when we have concerns that keep us from celebrating. But for the most part, we celebrate Christmas and we enjoy our time with our families. We enjoy our time with our friends. We all have traditions. Um, my grandmother's birthday was the 25th of December. And of course, my mother's family had eight children. You know, back in those days, people had a lot of children. So everybody gathered at her house every Christmas night. We all got there, and of course, all the grandchildren, all the children, and everybody else, and they were coming and going. And she just lived at a half a double, but 
for the most part, that's something that just always sticks in my mind, how the entire family gathered for her birthday. And yet she always managed to give every grandchild something small for Christmas, no matter how many there were. But um, she had blue lights on her Christmas tree. And we learned how to make paper stars, probably from her, from my mother, and so on. And she would take the Moravian stars and form crosses and stars, and she always had those on her tree. So my dad's side of the family, well, we always went to my grandfather's house, but my dad loved trains. My grandfather had this huge setup in the middle of his, right beneath his tree with the village, the whole nine yards. So I'm sure you all have traditions. Family is always important. But would we have Christmas without Easter? Would we have Christmas without the resurrection? So while we know that all of these scriptures are in the Bible, as a Christian, which really is the most significant? Is it the birth of Jesus? Or is it the resurrection? Or is it his ascension? Or is it what happened with Saul on his road to Damascus? As a child, we most, most of us do look forward to Christmas. It was magical for many, many children. It still is a fascination for many. The Santa coming, having gifts for us under the tree. And when we grow older, it's the magic of giving a gift. Maybe you give something you just can't wait to give them because you know they wanted it or something that's so special for them. Businesses close on Christmas Eve, and yes, Christmas is magical. Would anything have been written about what Jesus said in the temple if it weren't for the resurrection? It's entirely possible that Jesus' miracles would have been noted and logged. Jesus was a fascinating prophet, but it took that most significant miracle of death and resurrection that brings everything together. In John 6, we read about the miracle of the five loaves and the two fishes. It is the only miracle that is actually written about in all four Gospels. In a point that was brought out this week in one of the evangelical writings that I had read, it was that people in Jesus' time didn't necessarily follow him for his teachings. If anything, a lot of people probably wished he would just shut up. He, they wanted him to heal them. They wanted him to feed them. They wanted him to show more miracles. They did not necessarily want to hear what he had to say. They didn't want to hear about God. They didn't want to hear about salvation. They wanted, they wanted, give me, give me, give me. What do you have for me today? At that time, all of the Jesus followers wanted Jesus to be, was about having an army. They wanted them to be freed from, from the bondage of the Romans. And just think about that. The biggest issue, if you have an army, is feeding them, replenishing all those fallen troops. Well, Jesus could prove that he could do that. What was to stop this man? Jesus, he can do it all. Jesus was a, if Jesus were the king, he could prove it. He would show those Romans. But after the lessons, that day at the lake, Jesus left them. Well, how dare he? He left them. And the people of Jesus' day were no longer interested in the kingdom of God. They were only interested about following Jesus. They wanted him to be a king. They wanted him to defeat those Romans. They wanted him to show those people in the temple what was right. They did not care that Jesus wanted you, wanted you to be saved. They did not care that he, wants, that he is going to be sitting at the right hand of God in his kingdom. They wanted instant gratification. They wanted it all, and they wanted it now. They had suffered long enough. Those who were interested in this kingdom of God were also confused because the Jews only knew about the law, and their religion was only based on good works, on what they did. Well, Jesus told every, everyone that from now on, the work of God was simply to believe in one God and his son, Jesus. But people could not believe something that simple. By now, the people began to get frustrated. They began to fall by the wayside. And if Jesus is only talking about believing in something and is not going to save them from the Romans and their laws and their rules, well, it's just a waste of time. Many of us today are no different than those in Jesus' time, with the one exception. We know that final outcome. We know that Jesus rose from the dead, but we 
many times fall. Many times we fail him. I always like the song by the Newsboys. I always go back to music. Music is my thing. I'm going to read the lyrics. How are you going to reckon with a God like this? When are you going to face what you can't dismiss? What are you going to say to the soul kiss that is my God? Fearsome like the sag in a fat man's chair, sweeter than a patch of a Rogaine hair. How do you define what you can't compare? This is my God. There's no use explaining what can't be contained. I'm not following a God that I can lead around. I can't tame this deity. That's why Jesus is the final answer to who I want my God to be. He's who I want my God to be. How are you going to reckon with a God this great? Why, when, why are you going to measure what you can't equate? What are you going to say to the checkmate that is my God? Stronger than the burn of an aftershave. Tender as a burger in the microwave. Rarer than the air in an empty grave. That is my God. There's no use explaining what can't be contained. How are we going to work this out? To fabricate a God like this, no doubt, we'd end up worshiping a Christ of our own design. Jesus doesn't fit that profile. His ways aren't mine. I'm not following a God that's imagined. I can't invent this deity. And that's why Jesus is the final answer to who I want my God to be. He's who I want my God to be. Yes, Jesus is the final answer. We can't change the deity. The followers of Jesus' day wanted a Christ of their own design. He did not come to lead an army against the Romans. Jesus came to show love. He came to heal. He came to protect and to show others a new way. One of the greatest messages that Jesus ever gave was love thy neighbor as thyself. So this year in a few months, when we prepare for Christmas during the season of Advent, remember that celebrating Jesus' birth at Christmas would really be insignificant if it weren't for that empty tomb. Jesus' miracles may have been documented, but many of the stories of Jesus, such as his birth, speaking in the temple at the age of 12, feeding the 5,000, meeting with Zacchaeus, healing blind men, the raising of Lazarus, and even the crucifixion itself is still, in, is still only significant due to that empty tomb. After all, crucifixions were pretty common back in Jesus' time. So at Chris, Christmas, as Christians, we know the significance of that special gift that God gave the world, his one and only son. As you go about your daily routine this week, remember how the newsboys put it. We'd end up worshiping a Christ of our own design. Jesus doesn't fit that profile. His ways aren't mine. I'm not imagining, I'm not following a God that's imagined. I cannot invent his deity. And that's why Jesus is the final answer to who I want my God to be. He is who I want my God to be.